My name is Carol, and I'm 22 years old. I just graduated from college, and I've got a story to tell you about my house, well, technically, my mother's house. Or it was, until she passed away from intestinal cancer four years ago and left it to me. Mom was always the planning type. Even before the cancer diagnosis, she made sure everything was in order. The house was hers free and clear, she'd bought it before she even met my dad, and thank God for that foresight. She made sure I knew about the will, too. This way you'll always have a home, she told me, her voice steady, despite everything she was going through. Things weren't always this complicated. My parents' marriage lasted 10 years before dad decided to leave us, for another woman. I was nine when he packed his bags. No drama, no fighting over custody or property, he just left. The only thing he agreed to was paying for my college education. He set up a special account and transferred the entire sum for my future studies right away. I guess that was his version of child support. Dad started a new family pretty quickly. His wife Linda had their daughter shortly after, she's 10 years younger than me. I'd visit sometimes, staying at their rented house, but it never felt right. Linda would be busy with my half-sister, cooing over her latest accomplishment or fixing her hair. Dad was always working, claiming he needed to provide for his family. Funny how I wasn't really included in that category anymore. Carol, would you like to join us for dinner? Linda would ask, but her tone always suggested she hoped I'd decline. We kept things cordial though, exchanging birthday cards, holiday greetings, the occasional forced family dinner. It was all very proper and polite, in that uncomfortable way that makes your skin crawl. Mom made good money as a senior accountant, so when the cancer hit, she could focus entirely on treatment. I was 14 when we got the diagnosis. She quit her job immediately to focus on fighting the disease. For four years, we lived between hospital visits and treatment sessions. Mom never complained, not once. She just kept fighting, kept planning, kept making sure I would be okay. But cancer doesn't care about plans. I was 18 when she died, just weeks before I was supposed to leave for college in another state. The grief hit me hard, I could barely function. That's when Dad surprised me by actually stepping up. He, Linda, and my half-sister moved in temporarily to help me cope with the loss. I was too numb to question it at the time, too grateful for any support I could get. We'll help you through this, Dad said, putting his arm around my shoulders. Linda nodded along, trying to look sympathetic while my half-sister explored what was now my house. By the end of summer, I was faced with a dilemma. College was starting in a few weeks, and I had no idea what to do with Mom's house, my house now. I couldn't bear the thought of selling it, but leaving it empty for four years didn't seem smart either. That's when Dad came up with his proposal over breakfast one morning. Carol, he said, pushing his coffee mug aside, I've been thinking. What if we stayed here? We'd pay all the bills, maintain the place. You wouldn't have to worry about anything while you're at school. I looked at Linda, who was making pancakes at the stove. She turned around and smiled. It would be good for all of us, she added. Sophie's already enrolled in the local school, and the house would be well taken care of. It made sense. During the two months they'd been staying with me, things had been surprisingly okay. Linda had stopped being so distant, and Sophie, my half-sister, had actually started treating me like a real sister, instead of some stranger who showed up occasionally. So I agreed. Looking back, it seemed like the perfect solution. I packed up mom's personal things, keeping what I wanted and storing the rest in the attic. I left for college feeling confident about my decision. Over the next four years, I came home during holidays and summer breaks. Those visits were nice, actually. Linda would cook these big welcome home dinners. I made your favorite lasagna, she'd say, as if she'd always known my favorites. Sophie would drag me to her room to show me her latest artwork or tell me about school drama. During Christmas breaks, we'd all decorate the tree together. Dad would lift Sophie to put the star on top, while Linda and I argued good-naturedly about whether tinsel was tacky or classic. We'd sit around drinking hot chocolate, 
and sometimes I could almost forget that this wasn't the family I started with. Summer visits were different, longer, more relaxed. Sophie and I would spend afternoons by the community pool, and I'd help her with her summer reading. Linda would invite me to her book club meetings, and we'd actually have fun dissecting whatever romance novel they'd chosen that month. Your sister's so good with Sophie, I overheard Linda telling Dad one evening. It's nice having her home. That made me feel warm inside, like maybe we really had become a proper family. I called regularly during semesters, weekly chats with Dad about my classes, catching up with Linda about house maintenance, the roses you planted are blooming beautifully, Carol, and FaceTime sessions with Sophie, who kept me updated on her middle school adventures. Everything seemed perfect. We'd created this strange but functional family dynamic, built on the foundation of my mother's house. I never imagined it could all fall apart so quickly, but I guess that's the thing about houses, no matter how solid the foundation, you never know what's going on behind the walls. Finally, at 22, with my degree in hand and a job lined up back home, I was ready to start the next chapter of my life. I'd already accepted a position at Marshall and Brooks Financial in my hometown, they'd interviewed me via Zoom and offered me the job right away. Everything was falling into place perfectly. Or so I thought. The taxi dropped me off in front of my house on a sunny June afternoon. I stood there for a moment, taking in the familiar sight, mom's rose bushes were in full bloom, though they looked different from how she used to maintain them. The lawn was neatly trimmed, and new curtains hung in the windows. Little changes that had happened while I was away at college. Wheeling my suitcases up the front walk, I reached for my keys with a smile, already imagining sleeping in my old room tonight. But when I tried to unlock the door, something was wrong. The key wouldn't turn. I tried again, thinking maybe I was just tired from the journey, but no, the key definitely didn't fit. What the hell, I muttered, trying the key again before finally giving up and knocking on the door, loudly, since it was the middle of the day and they might be watching TV. Linda opened the door, her eyes widening in surprise. She was wearing an apron and had flour on her hands, like she'd been baking. Carol, what are you doing here? I wheeled my suitcase inside, noticing Dad and Sophie in the living room, both looking equally startled by my appearance. Sophie was sprawled on the couch with her phone, while Dad sat in his favorite armchair, Mom's old armchair, actually, reading something on his tablet. What do you mean? I live here, I said, looking around at what seemed like subtle changes to the living room decor. Why were the locks changed? Dad scratched his neck, that nervous habit he's had since forever. Oh, that. Yeah, I changed them last month. For safety, you know. There were some break-ins in the neighborhood. You could have told me, I said, trying to keep the annoyance out of my voice. Or sent me a new key. I mean, this is my house. We, weren't expecting you, Linda said carefully, her arms crossed over her chest. She'd wiped the flour off her hands and was looking increasingly uncomfortable. Why not? I graduated last week. I told you guys I was coming home to start my new job. I looked between them, feeling increasingly uneasy. Something was off about their reactions. Sophie had even put down her phone and was watching the scene unfold with an odd expression. Carol, Dad cut in suddenly, standing up. Can we talk in the office for a minute? I followed him into Mom's old office, my office now, technically. The room still had Mom's degrees on the wall, her collection of financial reference books on the shelves. He closed the door behind us, and I noticed his hands were shaking slightly as he turned to face me. Listen, honey, he started, his voice low. There's something you need to know. Linda, well, she thinks this house belongs to me. I stared at him, not comprehending. What? I told her it was my house, he continued, not meeting my eyes. That I gave it to your mother and you out of kindness after the divorce, and that after your mom passed, it reverted to me. She thinks you've just been living here because I allowed it. I must have stood there gaping at dad for a full minute, before finding my voice again. My first instinct was to storm out of the office and tell Linda everything. Now I understood her surprised look when I showed up, in her mind, 
I was just some freeloader trying to crash in their house. I have to tell her the truth, I said, moving toward the door, but dad caught my arm. Please, Carol, he begged, his voice barely above a whisper. Just give me a little time. I'll find us a new place to live, I promise. I just need to figure out how to tell her without destroying our marriage. Destroying your marriage? I hissed. What about what you're doing to me? He pulled a set of keys from his pocket, holding them out like a peace offering. These are for the new locks. Please, sweetheart. Just a few weeks, that's all I'm asking. Let me handle this my way. I took the keys, feeling sick to my stomach. Fine, I said finally. But this is insane, Dad. You know that, right? He nodded, relief washing over his face. Thank you, honey. I'll make this right, I promise. But things started going downhill immediately. At dinner that night, the atmosphere was thick with tension. Linda kept shooting me these looks across the table, all her previous warmth gone. The woman who used to bake my favorite cookies and invite me to book club now acted like I was a stranger who'd wandered in off the street. More potatoes, Dad? Sophie asked, completely oblivious to the tension. Would anyone mind if I redecorated the living room? Linda asked suddenly, not looking at me. The current setup is a bit, dated. I gripped my fork tighter, knowing she was talking about mom's furniture arrangement. Dad coughed awkwardly and changed the subject. The next morning, I was making coffee when Linda cornered me in the kitchen. She was still in her robe, hair uncombed, but her eyes were sharp and focused. Carol, she said, leaning against the counter. I think we need to talk about your plans. My plans? Yes. When are you planning to look for your own place? She asked it casually, like she was asking about the weather. Now that you have a job lined up, you should start thinking about moving out. You're a grown woman now, after all. I took a slow sip of coffee, counting to ten in my head. Actually, I've talked to Dad about staying here for now. He's fine with it. Linda's lips pressed into a thin line, and for a moment, I thought she might argue. Instead, she just turned and walked out of the kitchen, leaving me alone with my cooling coffee and a growing sense of dread about how this was all going to play out. The next two weeks were like living in a hostile environment. Linda's attitude shifted from cold to downright passive-aggressive. She'd accidentally wash my clothes with colors that would bleed, claiming she forgot which laundry basket was mine. She'd cook family dinners, but conveniently make just enough for three people, acting surprised when I came to the table. When I tried to watch TV in the living room, she'd suddenly need to vacuum right there. If I was using the kitchen to make breakfast, she'd barge in and start reorganizing the cabinets, muttering about how some people never learn to keep things tidy. She even moved my mother's favorite vase from its spot on the mantel to some corner shelf, claiming it didn't match her new decorating vision. The worst part was watching Sophie follow her mother's lead. My half-sister, who just weeks ago had been sending me memes and calling me for advice about boys, now rolled her eyes whenever I entered a room. She started calling me that girl when talking about me to her friends on the phone, loud enough for me to hear. Despite the tension at home, my professional life was taking off. I visited Marshall and Brooks Financial, where they showed me my future workspace, a nice corner desk, with a view of downtown. My future colleagues seemed friendly and welcoming, especially Sarah from the risk assessment team, who offered to take me to lunch. When do you start? She asked over sandwiches. Two weeks, I replied. Just enough time to settle in at home. That evening at dinner, I shared my start date with the family, trying to maintain some semblance of normalcy. They showed me my office today. I start in two weeks. Linda's fork clinked against her plate as she set it down with exaggerated care. Well, isn't that wonderful? Once you get your first paycheck, you can start looking for your own apartment. I know of some nice complexes across town, very affordable for young professionals. I caught Dad's pleading look across the table. His eyes seemed to beg me to keep quiet, to maintain his lie just a little longer. I stabbed at my peas and said nothing. 
To avoid the tension at home, I started reconnecting with old high school friends. Katie and Jessica were still in town, and we'd meet for coffee or shopping trips, falling back into our old rhythms as if no time had passed. But coming home was always uncomfortable. I'd walk in and hear hushed conversations from the kitchen or living room that would stop abruptly when I appeared. Dad and Linda would spring apart like guilty teenagers, papers would be hastily shoved into drawers, and fake smiles would plaster themselves across their faces. Saturday morning, I woke up to an unusually quiet house. No sound of Linda's weekend meal prep in the kitchen, no Sophie's music blasting from her room, no dad watching sports on TV. The silence felt wrong somehow, like the calm before a storm. I padded downstairs in my pajamas, checking each room as I went. The kitchen was spotless, not just clean, but unused since the night before. The living room was empty, the throw pillows perfectly arranged on the couch. Sophie's boots, usually cluttering the entryway, were gone. Even Dad's car wasn't in the driveway. I checked my phone, no messages, no notes about where everyone had gone. My first thought was that maybe they'd gone out for breakfast, but something felt off. They never went out for breakfast, without at least leaving a note. Even during these tense weeks, they'd maintained that basic courtesy. I tried calling Dad first, but his phone went straight to voicemail. Weird. I tried a few more times with the same result, that automated voice, telling me the person I was trying to reach was unavailable. A knot started forming in my stomach. Finally, I called Linda. She picked up on the fourth ring, just as I was about to hang up. What do you want? Her voice was sharp, hostile in a way I'd never heard before. In the background, I could hear waves and what sounded like tropical music. I just wanted to know where everyone is, I said, caught off guard by her tone. I woke up and the house was empty. She laughed, an ugly, mean sound that made my stomach clench. Oh, didn't we tell you? We're in the Maldives. First class flights, luxury resort, the works. We didn't mention it because, frankly, we didn't want you tagging along and expecting us to pay for you too. Not that you'd know anything about paying for things yourself. What? I wouldn't. Save it, she cut me off. I'm sick of this whole situation. You're nothing but a lazy freeloader, living in our house like you own the place. Your father might put up with it, but I'm done. Do you know how embarrassing it is to have a grown woman living in our house, eating our food, using our utilities? My hands were shaking so hard I could barely hold the phone. I sank into one of the kitchen chairs, my mother's chairs, actually, my legs suddenly too weak to hold me up. Linda, I... No, you listen to me, she snarled. Your father never loved you, you were just an obligation. He already wasted enough money on your college education, and now you're squatting in our house like some entitled princess. Well, I've had enough. Did you think you could just live here forever? Mooching off us while we work hard to maintain this home? I could hear Sophie giggling in the background, and Dad's muffled voice saying something I couldn't make out. The betrayal felt like a physical blow. When we get back, she continued, her voice dripping with venom, I want you gone. Do you understand me? Pack your things and get out of our house. If you're still there when we return, I'll throw you out myself. And trust me, I won't be gentle about it. I don't care where you go, live on the street for all I care. You're not our problem anymore. But. And don't bother trying to call your father. He agrees with me, he's just too weak to tell you himself. We've already blocked your number. Have a nice life, Carol, or don't. I really couldn't care less. The line went dead. I sat in that kitchen for what felt like hours, fury slowly replacing shock. They were living in my house, the house my mother had worked for, had left to me, and they had the nerve to call me a freeloader? To try to throw me out? Well, I'd had enough of playing along with Dad's lies. I blocked their numbers on my phone, my hands still shaking, but now with anger rather than hurt. Then I started methodically going through the house, gathering their belongings. Linda's expensive clothes, Sophie's school stuff, Dad's golf clubs, everything went into boxes and suitcases. 
I worked through the entire Saturday, fueled by rage and bitter disappointment. By Sunday morning, I had their life packed up and stacked in the garage. I found a 24-hour locksmith who could come right away. He worked quickly, replacing the locks on all the doors. It cost a small fortune, but it was worth every penny. When he finished, I handed him my credit card, feeling a strange sense of satisfaction as I clutched the new keys. Monday morning, I started my new job at Marshall and Brooks. For two weeks, I threw myself into work, learning the ropes, making new friends, trying not to think about the confrontation I knew was coming. I kept their stuff in the garage, but I rearranged the house back to how mom had it, removing every trace of Linda's decorating vision. Then came that Friday. I pulled into the driveway after work to find them standing there, dad looking nervous, Linda red-faced with fury, and Sophie hanging back with a scowl. They must have just gotten back from their vacation, their suitcases were still in their rental car. Linda started screaming before I even got out of my car. How dare you change our locks? How dare you lock us out of our own house? I walked calmly past them to unlock the door. Linda followed, still yelling. We're calling the police. This is breaking and entering. This is our house. I turned to face them, something inside me finally snapping. No, Linda, it's not your house. It never was. This house belongs to me. My mother bought it before she even met dad. She left it to me in her will. The only reason you've been living here is because I allowed it, temporarily. Linda laughed, but it was an uncertain sound. She looked at dad. Tell her she's lying, tell her this is our house. Dad wouldn't meet anyone's eyes. He just shrugged, his shoulders slumping. She's telling the truth. The house, it was always hers. I watched as the truth sank in, as Linda's face transformed from rage to calculation in a matter of seconds. Her entire demeanor changed, like a switch had been flipped. Oh, Carol, sweetheart, she said, forcing a laugh. You didn't think I was serious on the phone, did you? I was just joking. You know how I can get sometimes, all that sun and those tropical cocktails went to my head. Stop it, I said quietly, but she kept going. We're family, remember all those nice times we had? The book club meetings, the holiday dinners? We can have that again. She took a step toward me, arms outstretched like she was going to hug me. Dad jumped in then, his voice thick with emotion. Princess, I'm so sorry. I know I handled this all wrong, but I love you. You're my daughter. Please, can't we work this out? I looked at him, really looked at him. The father who left when I was nine. Who paid for my education, but missed my life. Who lied about my house, my inheritance, my mother's legacy. Work what out, dad? The fact that you lied to your wife about owning my house? Or the fact that you stood by while she planned to throw me out of it? Linda turned back to me with that fake smile. Carol, let's be reasonable. We can all live here together, we'll pay rent. No, I said firmly. We can't, your things are in the garage. Take them and leave. That's when Linda's mask cracked again. You ungrateful little bitch. After everything we've done for you. You'd throw your own family out on the street? I felt oddly calm as I replied, you just spent what, $10,000 on a luxury vacation you deliberately hid from me? Pretty sure you can afford an apartment. Carol, please, dad tried again, reaching for my arm. I know I messed up, but... No, I cut him off. You didn't mess up, you lied. Four years. You let your wife believe she owned my mother's house. You watched her try to redecorate it, rearrange it, erase every trace of mom. And when she planned to throw me out, you said nothing. I was going to tell her the truth, he protested. When? After I was gone? After she'd finished making my house her home? I shook my head. I'm done. Get your things and get out. I walked inside and closed the door, ignoring Linda's screams about ingratitude and cruelty. Through the window, I watched them loading boxes from the garage into their rental car. 
Linda was still yelling, her face red with fury. Sophie was crying. Dad just looked defeated. It took them three trips to get everything. As they loaded the last box, Dad tried one more time, knocking on the door. I didn't open it. They finally left as the sun was setting. The next day, Dad tried calling from a new number. Carol, please, he begged. We can fix this. No, Dad, we can't, I said. Linda made it very clear how you all really feel about me. A freeloader? An obligation? Someone you never loved? Maybe those were her words, but your silence said enough. That was two months ago. I still live in Mom's house, my house. I've repainted the walls, planted new roses in the garden, made it mine again. Sometimes I think about them, wonder where they ended up. But mostly, I think about Mom, and how she made sure I'd always have a home, no matter what. Dad still tries to call sometimes, from different numbers. I don't pick up anymore. Some bridges, once burned, should stay ashes. The funny thing is, I'm happier now. My job is going well, I've made new friends at work, and for the first time since mom died, I feel at peace in this house. Sometimes healing means letting go, of people, of lies, of the fairy tale of family you wanted to believe in.